On this week's What the Ship, we look at low water on the Mississippi River and the Panama Canal. We looked at the situation regarding Israel, Gaza, and Russia, Ukraine. We talk about the container sector, and we look at an oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome back to this week's What the Ship. So this is our weekly show where we look at top five news stories across the maritime domain, and there's a lot to choose from this week. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's jump into story number one. Story number one takes us to the Mississippi River. This story by John Kingston over at Freight Waves. Mississippi River isn't rising, but barge rates aren't getting higher. Despite continued low water levels, barge rates have declined and are well down from a year earlier. Okay, we know about low water levels on the Mississippi River. We've talked about them extensively on this channel. We've seen this happen quite annually now. However, what we're not seeing is a spike in the barge rates, and that's really interesting. So for that, we're going to go over to the best source there is on shipping and barge and freight rates in the United States. And no, it's not the U.S. Maritime Administration. It's the Department of Agriculture. This is the weekly grain transportation report put out by USDA. And believe it or not, it is probably one of the best sources out there on information. I absolutely love the USDA. They do a great job. They have this great highlights section that they do each week that gives you all you need to know about what is going on. And more importantly, the snapshot by sector, which is really important. So let's talk about export sales. So for the week ending November 9th, uh, unshipped balances of wheat, corn, and soybeans for marketing year 2023-24 totaled 33.41 million metric tons. That's up 10% from last week, down 7% from last year. If you go over to the barge sector for the week ending November 18th, barge grain movements totaled 742,000 tons. This was 1% high, more than the previous week and 12% less than the same period last year. Head on down to the oceans. For the week ending November 16, 22 ocean-going grain vessels were loaded in the Gulf, 12% less than the same period last year. Within the next 10 days, starting November 17th, 50 vessels were expected to be loaded 4% more than the same period last year. Okay, so what is going on in the grain sector and what's the big issue that is leading to these changes? The issue is very simple. It's the unprecedented drought at the Panama Canal that's altering the path of U.S. grain exports. We're going to talk a little bit more about this. If you look right here, the av monthly average on the Gatun water levels, you can see how far low it is. And while it's starting to come up, it's still well below the expected average. And that is meaning that we're seeing the diversion of shipping away from going through the Panama Canal, the large bulk carriers, principally going through the Neo-Panamax lane. That's the new lane of the Panama Canal built back in 2016. We're seeing the passage through the lane of that canal being reduced from the normal 10 vessels. It's expected to go down to five vessels by February 1st. And all this is impacting the ability to move grain through. One of the interesting charts they include here is this diversion chart. U.S. Gulf export routes to Japan. If you're coming out of the Mississippi River, out of New Orleans, it's about 9,141 nautical miles to Japan via the Panama Canal. If you go by Suez, it's 14,401 miles. If you go around the Cape of Good Hope, you only add roughly about 1,200 miles to that passage. However, if you assume a normal passage of about 12 knots, as they do here, that goes anywhere from a 32-day passage to Japan to a 50-54-day to 54 day passage. And what a 50-54-day to 54 day passage means, it's going to take you nearly twice as much time to go that route that you would to the Panama Canal, which means less cargo is going to be able to sail, means less voyages per ship per year, roughly half, and that means you can expect to see rates start increasing on that measurement as you go on. Yet, having said that, you look at this note here, despite the added ton miles from rerouting through the Suez Canal, freight rates from shipping grain from the U.S. Gulf to Japan have been below the four-year average. One possible reason is that U.S. Grain inspections at the Mississippi have been weak compared to the three-year average, dampening the demand for freight out of the U.S. Gulf. Another reason for the relatively low freight rate is the increase of total global dry bulk capacity in recent years. Still, freight rates could rise in coming weeks if dry bulk demand increases. 
I'll have a link of this report in the show notes, but one of the things it does is it breaks it down by rail, uh, breaks it down by truck. Uh, here is the barge transportation. One of the things to note is the three-year average, and you'll see that the weekly rate in barge traffic is down, so we're not shipping as much by barge at this time. You can also see the breakdown by crop, uh, soybean, wheat, and corn for the three-year average. Uh, you can see the movement by empty barges moving around the area, see the truck transportation, and then total grain exports of the sector as it comes in. So a really good measurement area to give you an idea of what is happening. Meanwhile, at the Panama Canal, we see in other sectors, particularly in liquefied natural gas, that Asian buyers are paying the premium to get their ships through the canal. We've talked about the really outrageous rates some people are willing to pay to get their ships through the Panama Canal. And the Panama Canal may be coming a bidding war here for ships to get through. Uh, moving on here, in other stories we see, Panama Canal congestion could help steer U.S. LNG cargoes to Europe. So that liquefied natural gas that typically moves to Asia, the biggest importers of U.S. LNG, have been Korea, Japan, and China. Now, all of a sudden, that LNG may be shifting over to Europe or taking the long boat ride around the Suez Canal or the Cape of Good Hope to get to Asia. That may mean that we see a reshuffling of where LNG comes. The other big exporters of LNG are Qatar and Australia. And if Qatar and Australia take the gap uh, left by the United States in Asia, that means U.S. LNG sales may start going down. Could be a big problem in export of U.S. LNG. Finally, we're seeing some of the container companies. This is MSC is slapping a surcharge on boxes through the restricted Panama Canal. They're putting this on. We've seen this happen earlier. We're seeing it expand now with higher and higher cost to get through the Panama Canal. All right, let's go ahead and jump to story number two. Story number two takes us over to the Red Sea and the seizure of the galaxy leader by Yemen, but more importantly, the impact that is having across the board. This story from Reuters, a new story out there, a container ship managed by an Israeli-controlled company was hit by a suspected Iranian drone in the Indian Ocean, causing minor damage to the vessel, but no injuries. Uh, Maltese flag CMA CGM Simi, recently renamed Mayat, was struck on Friday by an unmanned aerial vehicle, which appears to be an Iranian Shahad 136 drone in the northeast portion of the Indian Ocean. These are kamikaze drones. I think they're called missiles. I'm not sure. I think that's what you, a kamikaze drone basically is, is a missile. Uh, incident comes amid heightened security tensions due to the Israel-Hamas war and follows the seizure of an Iran-linked cargo vessel. The company that does this is a uh, Singapore-based Eastern Pacific shim shipping, which had rented Mayat. The key here is that they're focusing on ships that have links to Israeli owners. In this case, it's Israeli billionaire Aiden Ofer. And Ofer's ship was the target here. We're seeing this done time and time again. We've seen previous attacks on Israeli-owned shipping. No matter how many people want to argue about Galaxy Leader and who owns it, one of the owners is Israeli, and that's the reason that the Yemenis grabbed it, whether it's the Houthi or the Yemen military. They grabbed it because of that. There's over 100 ships that go through the Bab el-Mandab every day. You just don't grab that ship by random. Same time, you see this story by Greg Miller, yet another shipping choke point risk as Yemen rebels attack. One of the interesting things we're seeing right now, and Greg highlights it in this story, is that we're seeing ships on their AIS list their destination as armed guard on board. Uh, this is being done to signify that they have an armed detachment on board. And let me be clear. The attack by the Yemenis military or the Houthi or whoever that was who grabbed the vessel because the Yemen military is now on board, we'll talk about here in a second, is I, I don't think you deter them from doing these style of attacks, even with armed guards. Armed guards are meant to deter pirates, small raiding parties. When you're being boarded from a MI-17 with missiles, uh, it's going to be hard to really prevent that from happening. Yeah, you can shoot back. You can knock out a helicopter. I'm not saying you can't. The problem is, what, are the, what does Yemen bring next to bear that you can't outgun? And that becomes the problem. The Houthi have surface-to-surface -surface missiles. You are not going to stop a surface-to-surface -surface missile with some small arm weapons, machine guns, or, or even some, some uh, uh, rockets. It's just not going to happen. And one of the things we're seeing is ships are trying to do it. The big thing that's happening, we're seeing, is that ships that have Israeli owners are diverting. So two Raycar carriers, ships divert. 
after the Galaxy Leader's seizure. This is a Reuters story over in G Captain. And then the Galaxy Leader owner calls for the release of the crew after video surfaces. And we're seeing these videos come up. This is the commander of the uh, 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 Yemeni Navy who comes on board to assure the crew. Let me be clear, number one, I don't know what you have to do in the Yemeni Navy to get that many medals, but it's impressive. It's, it's an impressive amount of medals this dude is having uh, to wear. But then you see these other videos, and I'm just going to play this one video here for you. I'm gonna I'm not gonna play the music because the music is is over the top crazy uh, on this right here, but this video number one the flag budget in Yemen is is ridiculous. I don't know where you get flags that size made up very quickly. I'm not sure if Amazon delivers to Yemen. Uh, they must to get you a Palestinian and Yemeni flag that big to throw on there. But the amount of flags that they have adorned on this vessel is impressive. So let's be clear about a couple of things. Number one, if the U.S. Navy or any Navy really wanted to come in and seize this vessel, I'm pretty sure they can get the vessel back. But don't expect that to happen. This is a Bahamian flagged vessel. The U.S. Navy is probably not going to go chasing after a foreign registered vessel to go get it. This is one of the reasons you fly an American flag. If you had an American flag on this ship, which is about the only flag not flying from this ship right here, uh, then the U.S. would come or if it was British or French or Israeli. But since you're flying a flag of convenience, you take the risk. And unfortunately, it's the crews that suffer in this. This ship is going to be held until they decide to release it. And again, this is political why this is happening. Uh, this is a political political decision to seize this vessel. Same reason for the Iranians to strike the vessel out in the Indian Ocean. So this is all politics playing out and you're seeing merchant mariners and merchant shipping caught in the crossfire. All right, let's go ahead into story number three. Our next story takes us to the container sector. And as always, the container sector is all over the place. Uh, we've seen this since 2021 with the global supply chain crisis. But this story from Bloomberg, billionaire shipping scion warns of difficult time for industry. So this is Rodolf Sada, the billionaire head of the third largest container line in the world, CMA, CGM, where he's warning that the industry is entering a choppy period as new vessels ordered during the pandemic shipping era loom entering service. The difficulty in our sector is that we have a number of container ships that will come into the market starting next year. And that that runs the risk of creating an imbalance between supply and demand. We're expecting between 2 and 3% of trade growth next year. Saad said adding that CMA CGM is financially solid with significant market share in countries in which it's operating. That'll help it weather the difficulties. So when shipping companies get money, they buy ships. This is what they do. They don't have a sensible replacement plan where, you know, every few years they replace a few ships. They don't do that because they wait till they're awash in money and then they order like madmen. Uh, they are literally drunken sailors with money. And that creates the imbalance. And again, we see this across the board. This is a marine uh, uh, maritime executive story. Container capacity growth is unsustainable, warned Sea Intelligence. Sea Intelligence is one of these uh, groups that look at ocean shipping. Overcapacity for the key line of trade routes remain rampant, meaning that carriers are facing tough decisions at the end as the end of 2023 approaches. The container carriers continue to build massive amounts of new capacity with the first of the vessels ordered during the peak surge of the pandemic beginning to enter service and rumors of still more orders for large vessels. This is all coming from Alpha Liner. Alpha Liner shows the order book continues to overhang the industry. Currently, they calculate the top 10 carriers have approximately 6.1 million TEU on order, which is equal to 26%, 26% of their current capacity. One in four is what they have. Overall, the top 100 has over 6,700 vessels acted with a combined capacity of 28.3 million TEU and a total order book of 6.8 billion TEU. So what does that mean? Well, number one, there's a lot of old capacity out there, ships that need to be replaced, uh, burning, bad fuel, inefficient, wrong size. And so there's a lot of capacity out there. The question is, does this begin to see the mass scrappings that we all expected to happen? We haven't seen it yet. One of the big issues we saw is a lot of ships being built for that Neo Panamax lane of the Panama Canal. But as we said in story one, the Neo Panamax lane is down. It's down to half capacity or almost down to half capacity. 
that limits its ability to do it. Then you have tensions in the Red Sea and problems getting through the Suez. Our ship's going to have to start diverting around the Cape of Good Hope. This, uh, again, this is such a mess that we're seeing that we're not exactly sure what's going to happen with this capacity. Is it good or is it bad? At the same time, we're seeing shock in the rates. Shock as new Asia, Northern Europe, fact rate dwarfs weak spot market. This is from Lodestar. Uh, MSC, Mediterranean Shipping, has announced a new freight all kinds rate from Asia to Northern Europe for 15 December of $2,050 per 40 foot, that's FEU, which is at least double the level on offer in the current spot market. So the long term rate is double the spot market. And you ask yourself, why would I ever get that? I will just ship on the spot market. The problem is the spot market is flaky. It goes all over the place. What's great now may not be great later on. Sometimes it's better to lock in at the higher rate. And what we're seeing here is spot spot rates all over. You come down here to the very end of this story. Transatlantic voyage results have become unsustainable due to stubbornly low freight rates. The, uh, uh, this is the Zentia Northern Europe to U.S. East Coast spot slipped another 2.5% this week to an average of $1,260 per 40 foot, although market rates are said by fr- uh, forward contracts to be below 1000 And this story goes in hand with a story by Greg Miller over at Freight Waves. Dire scenario for shipping lines more likely as spot rates fall back. Spot rates give back quarter four gains, lowering bar for 2024 contract rates. So as spot rates remain low, there's going to be a push to pull down the long-term rates. Long-term rates are about 70% of normal shipping rates. Spot rates are about 30%, and they both pull at each other all the time. Meanwhile, We see these reports coming in. Mike Schuller over at G-Captain. Port of Los Angeles reports growth, cargo growth for third straight month. uh, This uh, October possessed uh, the port processed a total of 725,000 TEUs in October, marking a 7% improvement compared to the same month last year. Why is that happening? Well, that's because people are diverting cargo from going through the Panama Canal to the U.S. West Coast. And you would expect then to see a drop on the container rates on the East Coast. However, you see this story, Port of Savannah sees notable uptick in container calls. The Garden City Terminal experienced a significant increase in the number of container ship calls last month with 129 visits for a 26% rise compared to October 2022. The Port of Savannah handled a total of 449,000 TEUs, 20-foot equivalent units, in October, making it the fourth busiest October on record, representing a 5% increase compared to the same month in 2019. However, October volumes were down nearly 19% compared to last year, which marked the second busiest month in Savannah history. So... A lot of cargo is moving. A lot of freight is still moving. However, the rates are so low. This is what's really pushing a lot of cargo to sea because of the low transportation costs right now. But with the flooding in the marketplace of new container ships, the big question is going to be, will the container carriers begin to pull uh, ships out of service, scrap them, or are they going to sell them? And that puts potential competition out there on the market against them. Just a lot going on. But Don't expect to see any sort of semblance of order come out of the container market until literally, I'm going to say after 2024. I think 2024 is going to be a big mess when it comes to the container market. It's going to be all over the place. Not exactly sure how it all settles out here at the very end. And as if that is not enough, you have this story from Splash 24-7. Just two bidders left in the race over HMM. HMM, one of the largest container liners in the world. Korean has been owned and operated by the Korean government for a while. They did not want to allow HMM to collapse the way uh, we saw happen in the past. We saw way back in 2017 with Hanjin collapse. You see HMM being up for bid, so be Good question here. Who takes over one of the largest container liners in the world? With all the focus on the Red Sea and what's going on between Israel and Hamas, let's not forget we have another war going on, the Black Sea. This is Russia, Ukraine. And one of the things that we saw sweep across the Black Sea this past week was a massive storm that actually claimed two ships sunk up on the Black Sea. Uh, This is a really treacherous area of the ocean up there in the Black Sea gets notoriously bad. See these stories about cargo ships going missing. One, a Turkish cargo ship with 12 crew members on board went missing off the coast. 
this is just torrential. And one of the things that these storms do is there's such severity that they will rip loose mines that have been laid by both the Ukrainians and the Russians, causing a lot of problems, which is one of the reasons why you see this. A bulk carrier hits a mine off the coast of Ukraine. This follows on the heels of a strike against a ship in Ukrainian waters by the Russians that actually killed a crew member on board. So it's getting much more destructive with the end of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Ukraine has opened up a path up into the Ukrainian ports. Ships are coming up into those ports. However, we are seeing strikes being leveled against these vessels. You may ask, well, how are ships still going up to Ukraine? Well, this deal right here by Reuters, November 14th, Ukraine and Britain reached deal on discounted insurance for Black Sea exports. Uh, Ukraine and Britain have agreed on a special mechanism for discounts on war risk insurance on exports through the Black Sea Corridor, which helped transport almost 4 metric million metric tons of goods since August. Kyiv launched a humanitarian corridor for ships bound for Africa and Asian markets. They're going many other places besides there. Uh, the Ukrainian prime minister said this, it will make it possible to make a discount on the cost of insurance against military risk for exporters of all products from Ukraine. This will make the Black Sea Corridor more accessible to a wider range of exports. The key thing here is Ukraine could have provided the war risk insurance for it. The problem is that they have a track record of having to be able to pay that. It is much easier for Ukraine to help offset to kind of uh, uh, subsidize the cost for war risk insurance and that is exactly what they're doing going through britain for this and we're seeing that insurance premiums have sh risen sharply following a russian attack on a liberian flagged civilian vessel entering the port of Ode odessa region in early november killing a ukrainian pilot injuring four crew members first strike involving a commercial ship in many months goes on here this attack is of course bad it affects the cost of freight and the willingness of traders to buy grain from us and work with Ukraine. We understand that Odessa region ports need to be protected. Everyone is doing it and the situation is improving every week and we will see exports. And when you start looking at those grain exports, you start seeing that. Ukraine expects a harvest of 79 million metric tons, excuse me, 79 million tons of grain and oil seeds in 2023 with its 2023-2024 exportable surplus totaling about 50 million tons. Ukrainian grain exports have fallen to 9.8 million tons as of November. November 6th, marketing season uh, from 14.3 million a season earlier. So they're not getting out as much. They're going to have excess sitting there waiting to get out. And for the Ukrainians, it's really important to get this out to sustain their economy. At the same time, we're also seeing a tightening up on the oil embargoes and the oil price cap, I should say, on fuel coming out. Greek shippers exit Russian oil trade as U.S. tightens price cap scrutiny. Three major Greek shipping firms have stopped transporting Russian oil in recent weeks in order to avoid U.S. sanctions now being imposed on some shipping firms carrying Russian oil, four traders told Reuters. So again, when Russian oil went over the $60 per barrel cap, they should not have been able to get P&I insurance, which is the insurance for the cargo. And if you can't get insurance for the cargo, you shouldn't haul the cargo. But again, the U.S. is leveraging through political means along with economic means to get carriers, in this case, for Greek shipping firms, not to haul Russian oil, which is meant to, again, not stop the shipping of Russian oil. They still want Russian oil flowing because they don't want to cause a huge worldwide economic energy issue. But what they want to do is make sure that Russia can't profit from it, hence the price cap. All right, let's go ahead and head over to our last story. Last story, always aim to find something that's under the radar that people aren't following. Mike Schuller posted this on November 20th. Massive oil leak near New Orleans, over 1 million gallons potentially released. Suspected pipeline leak near Plaque Mines, I get my... Cajun is terrible. Paris, southeast of New Orleans, could have led to the release of over 1 million gallons of crude oil. A unified command has been established to monitor and respond to the oil spill known as MPOG 11015 incident. I can't understand why that hasn't caught on at all. This is near the near the main pass oil gathering company's pipeline system. And over the past few days, Unified Command had conducted overflights. On Friday, visible oil was observed moving southwest away from the Louisiana shore. Probably one of the reasons why this has not triggered a lot. 
Uh, it goes on here. The total volume of discharge of oil is currently unknown. However, initial estimates suggest that approximately 1.1 million gallons of crude oil may have been released. The affected pipeline, which spans 67 miles, was closed by MPOG on Thursday morning. This follow-up story over at Maritime Executive, 3% of Gulf oil production shut by the pipeline bre- breach. Uh, the spill released up to 1.1 million gallons, forced a shut in of about 61,000 barrels a day of production, according to the Co- uh, Coast Guard. Six producers use the Main Pass Oil Gathering Company line, 67 mile pipeline extending east from the Mississippi Delta. The Coast Guard identified the affected producers as W&T Energy 6, Occidental Petroleum, Walter Oil and Gas. Cantium, Arena Offshore, and Talos Energy Energy uh, Ventures. The spill has ceased, and skimmers were deployed to target concentrated areas of slick for cleanup. About 210 gallons of oily water mixture was recovered. 210 gallons out of 1.1 million gallons. This is underwater pipelines, always susceptible, unfortunately, and it's a big problem that we see. So five stories spanning the maritime domain. Man, a lot going on. I I do think that story number one on the Mississippi River and the Panama Canal is the big one to be watching right now. Obviously, a lot of attention in the war zones and the Red Sea and the, uh, the Black Sea. So much going on. The container sector is all over the place. Uh, it's obviously dealing with global economics and imports and exports. And then finally, the, the, the oil spill in the Persian, excuse me, in the Gulf of Mexico, just not getting a lot of attention. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment and subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a big thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Well, you can hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon and become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off.